Good evening. We begin tonight with a bombshell, a bombshell book by Michael Wolff, which paints a stunning picture of dysfunction in the Trump campaign and White House and contains stunning quotes from Steve Bannon, who is, let's remember, the president's former top political advisor, his campaign mastermind, the one who stood by him when no one else would, even when the Access Hollywood tape hit. Now it seems Bannon has turned on his old boss. Bannon, on the record, saying things implicating him in the Russia probe and that suggests Trump's oldest son and son-in-law committed treason. And yet for all that, Bannon told Michael Wolff for the new book, Fire and Fury Inside the Trump White House. It's only part of the picture. Wolf paints of the president, how he operates, and a White House under fire. Wolf says he based the book on conversations and interviews with most members of President Trump's senior staff, even the president himself. According to Wolf's book, here's what Steve Bannon said about the June 2016 Trump Tower meeting between Russians promising dirt on Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump Jr., son-in-law Jared Kushner, and campaign chairman Paul Manafort. Quote, the three senior guys in the campaign thought it was a good idea to meet with a foreign government inside Trump Tower in the conference room on the 25th floor with no lawyers. They didn't have any lawyers. Even if you thought that this was not treasonous or unpatriotic or bad s expletive, and I happen to think it's all of that, you should have called the FBI immediately. Bannon said more on that subject, and we'll get to that. But first, though, keeping them honest, the White House disputes much of the book. But what's really interesting is the White House line of attack on Steve Bannon now, which seems to be exactly what they've done time after time, insisting that the person in question never really was much of a player after all. They did it with Paul Manafort. They did it with George Papadopoulos. They did it with Michael Flynn. They did it with Carter Page. And now listen to what they're saying about Steve Bannon. The president said, in part, Steve Bannon has nothing to do with me or my presidency. When he was fired, he not only lost his job, he lost his mind. Sarah Sanders was asked about that today. The president's statement suggests that Steve Bannon had very little influence in the White House, but the president himself elevated him to the same level as the chief of staff and put him on the National Security Council. How do you reconcile that? Uh, I wouldn't say that he elevated him to the same level of the chief of staff, and I think that in the actions that Steve took, the president was clear that it didn't have a lot of influence on him or the decision-making uh, process throughout his time here at the White House. Okay, so Sarah Sanders saying that the president's former campaign CEO and then chief White House political strategist did not have a lot of influence. Let's just look at some pictures to begin. Look, there's Steve Bannon one-on-one with the president. Take another look. There's Steve Bannon exercising his walk-in privileges at a meeting in the Oval Office. Oh, look, there's Steve Bannon with members of the president's national security team. And even after he left the White House, Steve Bannon continued to speak with the president. A very quick one, which is I just don't understand the timing of something. Steve Bannon left in the summer, late summer. If the president says he lost his mind in when he left, why did he continue to talk to him for so many months? That's a good question. Press Secretary Sarah Sanders answered by suggesting there was nothing irreconcilable about those two irreconcilable notions. Uh, Look, the president uh, continued to have conversations with him, often uh, asked for by Mr. Bannon. The president spoke with him, but that doesn't mean that he can't hold that position. So she's saying that the president of the United States is having conversations with someone that he believes has lost his mind. Let that sink in. And while you do that, as for Sanders' claim that Bannon and chief of staff Reince Priebus were not on equal footing, which is what Sarah Sanders said today, Here is the press release naming them to their jobs. Listen to the wording, please. President-elect Donald J. Trump today announced that Trump for President CEO Stephen K. Bannon will serve as chief strategist and senior counselor to the president, and Republican National Committee Chairman Reince Priebus will serve as White House chief of staff. Bannon and Priebus will continue the effective leadership team they formed during the campaign, working as equal partners to transform the federal government. Equal partners, Reince Priebus, Stephen Bannon transforming the federal government together as equal partners, despite what Sarah Sanders said today. Again, the White House disputes much of what came out in excerpts in this new book by Michael Wolff. Sarah Sanders, today. We're certainly happy for people that have different opinions, but there's a difference between different opinions and different facts. Uh, And people are entitled to an opinion, but they're not entitled to their own facts. And we have a big problem with people putting out misleading information. Those are very different things. Sarah Sanders today talking about people putting out misleading information. Let that one sink in for a moment. 
As we said, the White House line on this is downplaying Steve Bannon's role in the White House and outside the White House, and it comes straight from the top. CNN Jim Acosta joins us now from the White House with the president's remarkable reaction. Jim, we, 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 I read yeah. just a line of what the president said, but, but the president issued this statement in response to those quotes from Bannon. Uh, as I said, I mentioned just a line of it. W- explain the whole quote, what he said. Oh, Anderson, I think we can retire the term dumpster fire because I think the bomb cyclone hit Washington a day early. Uh, we saw that here at the White House uh, with the reaction to Steve Bannon. Uh, I've never seen a statement from the president uh, like this aimed at somebody uh, who works so closely with him and so high up as, in his administration. Uh, but let's put this uh, up there. We can read it to you. It's, it's pretty remarkable. It says Steve Bannon has nothing to do with me or my presidency. When he was fired, he not only lost his job, he lost his mind. Now that he is on his own, Steve is learning that winning isn't as easy as I make it look. Steve had very little to do with our historic victory. Steve was rarely in a one-on-one meeting with me and only pretends to have had influence to fool a few people with no access and no clue whom he helped write phony books. A couple of things, Anderson. One is um, the White House press secretary, Sarah Sanders, did say today that the president is furious uh, about all of this, and that is why uh, we saw this, this statement from the president today. But keep in mind, and one thing we haven't mentioned, uh, is that uh, despite the fact uh, that the president uh, feels Steve Bannon uh, lost his mind when he was fired last summer, he continued to take his advice right up until the Alabama Senate race. Remember, much of this town, uh, much of the Republican Party was saying, stay away from Roy Moore in Alabama. Whose advice did the president follow? Steve Bannon's. Do we know, I mean, was there something in particular that made the president respond as strongly as he did in that incredible statement? Well, I talked to a source close to the White House earlier this evening who said that Steve Bannon basically crossed the line when he went after the first family, when he went after Don Jr., when he went after uh, Melania Trump, saying, uh, according to one Michael Wolff excerpt that was uh, put in the New, uh, New York magazine earlier today, that she was distraught and in tears on election night. Uh, that going after the president's family was basically crossing a line and going too far. And in the words of this one source close to the White House, that meant the gloves had to come off. And at this point, uh, they are not holding back. Uh, That suggests, Anderson, pretty strongly uh, that this war on Steve Bannon over here at the White House may continue for days, if not weeks. Right. We should point out uh, the Michael Wolf's book is saying that that the first lady was distraught on election night because he won. She didn't expect him to win, didn't want him to win. Uh, And it seemed to indicate that many people in the Trump orbit did not expect him to win at all and maybe even thought it wasn't a good idea if he did win. In a rare, that's right, Anderson, in a rare statement from the First Lady's office that we don't hear very much from, uh, the First Lady's office put out a statement uh, saying that Steve, this book uh, that was largely based on this interview with Steve Bannon, these conversations with Steve Bannon, Michael Wolf's book, belongs in the uh, bargain fiction section of the bookstore. Uh, So it is pretty remarkable to see this kind of statement, not only coming from the president, but also the First Lady's office as well. Yeah, more to come, no doubt. Jim Acosta, appreciate that. As we said, Michael Wolf's book has more from Steve Bannon and the Trump Tower meeting, including this, which, again, if true contradicts all the denials that the candidate knew anything about it. Quote, the chance that Don Jr. did not walk these uh, Jumos up to his uh, father's office on the 26th floor is zero. Talking about walking the Russians up. And yes, we've reported that the president was in the building at the time of that meeting. As for his son, Bannon suggests he will not stand a chance against investigators, telling Wolf, and I quote, they're going to crack Don Jr. like an egg on national TV. Perspective now from three season Trump watchers Josh Green, author of Devil's Bargain, Steve Bannon, Donald Trump, and the Storming of the Presidency, Michael D'Antonio, author of The Truth About Trump, also seen in Political Analyst in New York Times, White House correspondent Maggie Haberman. Um, I don't even know where to begin with you, Maggie, but um, what do you make of, I mean, did you ever think that there would be a day where President Trump calls <laughs> Steve Bannon? You know, that he's lost his mind and that and that he didn't really have much to do at all with the campaign. I wish mean, <laughs> that was the most predictable thing that of all of this was that he was going to say that the pre- that uh, Steve Bannon had nothing to do with the campaign or his presidency, because as you pointed out at the beginning of this segment, that is their go to. Right. I mean, I get George time. Papadopoulos um, saying he's the coffee boy or Carter Page. <laughs> look, who didn't have a meeting, he, with but president. he's done a version of this before. Remember, he, de- he delivered a brushback to Bannon earlier right. uh, in 2017, which was essentially Steve's a guy who works for me. And this was when Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump were complaining about Bannon. However, I did not think we would see the fireworks that we saw um, today. Normally we see fireworks on New Year's, not right after. And this has been um, extremely unusual. Saying that Steve Bannon had nothing to do with the campaign or had nothing to do with the White House would be like saying 
David Axelrod had nothing to do with the White House. Now, David Axelrod literally was there at the very beginning of Barack Obama's presidential campaign. Steve Bannon was not. That is not the same. The stuff that Bannon... But, but Steve Bannon was there when that Access Hollywood tape came absolutely. out. And, and every And a lot of he folks, Ryan Priebus, was, you know, he was getting in, off the he train. Was, he was brought in to fix things when Manafort right. was fired. He was seen as the solution. And to be, um, to be fair to him... Um, the reality is that uh, if they had not made that change, almost all of Trump's uh, advisors agree that Trump probably would not have won. He was very comfortable with Bannon. That was a that was a real relationship. He liked Bannon. Um, that uh, obviously has uh, dissolved into something else. And the comments that Bannon made about Trump's son, Don Jr., were seen as crossing the line. Remember, Breitbart, Bannon's website, has been attacking Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, um, even attacking Ivanka Trump for a while now. But this is in Bannon's own voice, attacking his son, accusing him of treason, saying that he must have known, of, essentially saying there is a there there right. that's being investigated in the Russia probe. That's counter the party line. That's counter the White House line. It's really stunning. Yeah. Josh, I mean, the sources of some of these quotes, we should say, is opaque. It's not always clear yeah. who is recounting these stories. At one point, Wolf writes about an idea Kushner credited to Bannon. Wolf reports, uh, quote, Bannon said the president jumping on his son-in-law. That wasn't Bannon's idea. That was my idea. It's the Trump way, not the Bannon way. How much of, of his, I mean, how much of this about Bannon finally exerting that it, I mean, can we, that it can be the Bannon way? I mean, what do you, what do you make of some of these quotes? I mean, I don't know what to make of some of these quotes. I don't know who uh, Wolf's <laughs> sources were. I, I, I think it's pretty clear that Bannon t- talked to him at great length. But at the same time, Wolf was parked in the West Wing of the White House for a good deal of the early portion of uh, the Trump the Trump administration. Uh, and also, it's clear, talked to all sorts of other senior advisors. He, so, he was parked I, there. He was there in the White House. Yes, literally, yes, literally in the White House. So, and he, But he was also talking to other advisors, too. So while I have no doubt that uh, Bannon is responsible for some of the more colorful language uh, and that he probably did say things that, like, you know, Ivanka Trump is dumb as a brick. I don't think we can automatically conclude that, you know, every negative uh, scene about Trump or so on came directly from Bannon. Uh, And, you know, the other factor here, I've been talking to some people around the White House and around Trump, is Michael Wolff was the author of a Rupert Murdoch biography. And Trump has long worshipped Rupert Murdoch. It was suggested to me, too, that was one of the reasons why uh, Wolf was able to get the kind of face time and access that he apparently had for the book. And, and uh, Maggie, you agree with that, that uh, just in terms of the, of the quotes? I mean, wh- what do you make of some of these I mean, so, so I, I think there are some things in the book that are true. I think there are some things in the book that are not true. Um, I have read the book, and I'm pretty familiar with the material. Um, I think that... Um, uh, Josh is right that this is not just coming from Bannon. There were multiple aides who spoke to him. Um, What Josh seems to be suggesting is that he had access to the president. And that, as far as I understand it, is not true. What Mm -hmm. he... He had a phone call that he just doesn't describe in the book as Trump calling him. He describes it as Trump calling a New York media associate. And the basic substance of the call was the president was angry about a story that Glenn Thrush and I had written very early on. He was angry about this. He was angry about that. Um, And that appears to be the extent of the time that Michael Wolff got with Trump. Now, maybe I'm wrong, and Michael Wolff should obviously say that if that's that's the case. Um, But it's left vague, and it seems intentionally uh, so. Um, a lot of this appears to be um, concluding what Trump was thinking based on what various advisors were yeah, saying. Yeah, and, and I should say, I have, I have no firsthand knowledge that Wolf did or didn't have any interview with, with, with Trump. Right. Uh, it, 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 it was made to appear so in the excerpts of the book that I read, but I have no idea what the sourcing or editing was like in that book, so I couldn't say for sure. Michael, I mean, as someone who's, you know, uh, profiled Donald Trump uh, over the years, it, you know, I think back to when Steve Bannon was on the cover of Time magazine, and that's something obviously... Donald Trump does not like if anybody else is outshining him, particularly if it's uh, an underling or, you know, even a very top underling. Well, that's absolutely true. And I think if we recall how Jeff Sessions has fared, the president hasn't let go of his annoyance with Jeff Sessions. So I think we're beginning what's going to be a battle royale. This is going to be a a fight between Trump and Bannon. Uh, Bannon actually is a very savvy, very intelligent player of the media. He's every bit as good at it as Donald Trump is. So there's also going to be the author of the book brought into the mix. So his methods and practices aren't exactly mine. I I wouldn't (laughs) use 500 words of a supposed conversation that I didn't witness 
in a book and portray it as a quote. So there's a lot for the president and his folks to attack. And that makes it troublesome for the rest of us in the press because we're going to have to talk about what the media does to Donald Trump, and he'll make a big issue of that. Maggie, I mean, does it, um, does it, do, do you think the president had any idea that this was coming? Because, I mean, Michael Wolff had made right. earlier some public mm-hmm. statements which were sort of positive toward uh, the Trump sure. White House. And, and I always thought, oh, well, is he trying to curry favor in some mm-hmm. way or get access? Mm-hmm. I didn't realize he was already inside the White House. Yeah, so, I mean, two things. I mean, what Josh said that he was parked, that Michael Wolff was parked in the West Wing. I mean, literally, I, I saw him in, in, in the lobby of the West Wing at least once um, waiting to go see Steve Bannon. So that, that is definitely true that he was there. Um, I, I believe the president did know about the book. His aides certainly knew about about it. Um, they did not expect it to be as, a, as uh, controversial and kind of slice, uh, you know, knife cuts as it is. Uh, and I think they were caught off guard by that. Michael said something that, that made me think of what you just mentioned, the, the media coverage. And, uh, you know, there are going to be a fo- there's going to be a focus on how the media covers Trump. Michael Wolf was indeed very critical of how almost everybody else covered um, Donald Trump very early on in the administration when that was... Um, the president's perspective as well. His words lined up pretty closely with right. the president's at a point when he was trying well, to get uh, an interview with the president. Um, he he then has offered a, a book, uh, nearly 300 pages of which basically portray uh, much of what everyone else in the media who covers the White House or covers the investigation into Russia has been portraying for quite some time. Right. So, um, so some of this is certainly affirming of reporting that's taken place, and some of it is um, shedding or uh, alleges to shed new light on on other uh, aspects of what has taken place. Well, the, um, the, the president's going to feel very betrayed yeah, right now. Absolutely. And, that's, that's what and, I'm trying to say. And this should. plays yeah. right <laughs> into his anger and right. rage at the media, into his lifelong narrative that everybody is a bad guy. Everybody can be purchased. Everybody is going to betray him. Everyone is dishonest. And so when he lies and and distorts, he's going to say, well, I'm just doing what everybody does. Everybody lies and distor- distorts. Mm-hmm. Look at the dishonest media. Josh, you were going to say something? Yeah, I, you know, Anderson, Ma- Maggie is too polite to say this, but one of the things that Wolf was also up yes, to I'm here was he was, of that. Thank he you, was, he was, I'm standing up for you here. He was, too, <laughs> he, he was attacking, I think, Maggie's specific reporting during the time he was trying to get access to these people, and he did. I mean, he manipulated the egos uh, of the people in the White House to get this kind of access, to get up close, uh, and then turned around and wrote the kind of book they weren't expecting. But I think it's also important to be clear here that this was something, this, this type of book was precisely the type of, of coverage that Wolf himself was criticizing to ingratiate himself with Bannon, uh, with Kellyanne Conway, with a lot of senior White House officials, and it worked. Mm. Um, but but we should, he should also be called out for that, I think, and people should be clear about uh, how it was that he wound up in a situation where he could write this kind of right. book. We've got to take a quick break. Uh, coming up next, more from this book, much more on how the president operates and how allegedly little he's been learning on the job, the very serious allegations about the Russian investigation contained in the book, and later reaction from one of the leading Russian investigators on Capitol Hill, Senate Intelligence Committee Vice Chair Mark Warner. Want more than just the headlines? Join me, Don Lemon, on CNN Tonight for a no-holds-barred breakdown of all the day's top stories. CNN Tonight with Don Lemon, weeknights at 10 Eastern on CNN. We're talking about Michael Wolff's bombshell of a book, what Steve Bannon said to him and what others say about the president and how he works. And we should underscore, because this is already raising questions, that some of the juiciest excerpts do not come in the form of direct quotes. Here's Wolf characterizing the impressions of Deputy Chief of Staff Katie Walsh uh, that she had of the president, allegedly, in her early days in the job. Quote, he didn't process information in any conventional sense. He didn't read. He didn't really even skim. Some believe that for all practical purposes, he was no more than semi-literate. He trusted his own expertise, no matter how paltry or irrelevant, more than anyone else's. It was said, Walsh, quote, like trying to figure out what a child wants. Now, that last part is a direct quote. The other stuff is just from Michael Wolf. Now, we called Katie Walsh, and she referred us to what she told reporter Jonathan Swan of Axios, which was that she never said the things attributed to her. That said, the passage does seem to jive with how one other advisor, Sam Nunberg, described the candidate's attention span. Quote, early in the campaign, Sam Nunberg was sent to explain the Constitution to the candidate. Quote, I got as far as the Fourth Amendment, Nunberg recalled. Quote, before his finger is pulling down on his lip and his eyes are rolling back in his head. Um, you know, 
Does that? It's very understated, as always. <laughs> I mean, there has Sam been a lot out about yes. how the president doesn't read right. and how he processes sure. information. Mm -hmm. So it's not really. No, I mean, look, the, the that first of all, I think that Nunberg is on the record on that anecdote, at least in some fashion. Um, so that doesn't seem completely out of out of line. Um, I, I think that there are several uh, areas where. Uh, there is something that is notionally accurate, but the facts are not are not quite right. I mean, he he got. I mean, again, I hate to take it back to this, but just standing out in my head, just he got minor things. You know, sh shots he took at other media outlets. He got just basic details wrong mm -hmm. about stories, about things. And you know, I worked with a lot of um, journalists earlier in my career who would talk about dealing in larger truths. Um, the the actual details do matter, especially if you're going to purport that these are quotes from people. And he he claims, as Michael said, to have, you know, he paints these scenes right. of 500 word exchanges so, of dialogue. But let's talk about, with Steve Bannon, why would Steve Bannon go after the, say these things about the president? I mean, mm -hmm. he was, you know, so close to him all during this campaign. What is going on? So, I mean, What's I think the strategy? It, I think a couple of things. I don't, know, I don't know how much of it is a strategy per se. I think that Bannon had genuine frustrations about the way that White House was run. I think that he and Jared Kushner repeatedly butted heads. We saw that throughout 2017. And there was really nobody to kind of um, uh, arbit the Wild West that was the West Wing. John Kelly uh, made a huge difference once he came in as chief of staff in terms of how the staff functioned. He obviously has not changed the behavior of the president. You can just look at Twitter for that. Um, but uh, it became a different uh, place. And the one thing that I do think became a, uni a unifying factor for White House staff members in 2017 was they all became unified against Steve Bannon. You saw that today in their statements, too. I think Bannon feels like he has nothing left to lose. And also, I think he is aware, um, A, that they are watching him very warily about how he's going to try to run this slate of candidates in 2018, um, outsider candidates, insurgents uh, in the midterms. And then he is going to paint himself as a kingmaker and the counterbalance and perhaps rightful inheritor of the Trump movement. I think they are trying to get that done. And I think he feels, knowing that's coming, he doesn't really have a whole lot to lose. But Josh, you know, for those interested in the Russia investigation, I mean, the allegations that Bannon is saying that, you know, he can't imagine that Donald Trump Jr. didn't bring these people up to to meet the president, uh, to meet the president elect, which or to meet the candidate at that point. I mean, I, that hadn't even been much in consideration. I mean, I, I always thought, well, it may be. You know, there, there's a high potential that Donald Trump Jr. told his father about the meeting or what he felt about the meeting. Um, but it's pretty stunning what, you know, what Steve Bannon is, is saying about Donald Trump Jr. There's going to be cracked like an egg on national television, that it was treasonous. Well, it's certainly been an open question. Did Don Jr. tell his father about that? That's one of the one of the questions we don't have answers to yet. But I think it's important to stipulate that Bannon himself, I don't believe, was in a position to know. Uh, this meeting took place in June. Bannon didn't join the campaign until mid-August. So the way I read that excerpt was Bannon was asserting or speculating uh, or positing right. that this happened, but I don't. I don't think we have any way of knowing. I'm not sure Bannon has any way of knowing uh, what was said in that meeting, what Don Don Jr. did afterward, and whether or not Trump himself was ever told about it. It, it is interesting that, but just the extent, Michael, now that the White House is basically trying to diminish Steve Bannon's role. Well, sure, and there is a lot of surmisal in what's been written and what's been suggested by Bannon. I think one of the dynamics that Maggie might be able to speak to well is that Bannon. His agenda, I think, is different from the mainstream Republican agenda, and President Trump seemed to gravitate toward that mainstream agenda as the first year of his presidency evolved. So you wind up with this tax bill that the Bannon base doesn't like. There's nothing populist in this tax bill. In fact, Trump abandoned the promises he made about taxes and about other things that the Breitbart alt-right crowd really hung their hats on. And so maybe Bannon is exacting some revenge for the loss of his agenda as well. Josh, I mean, another excerpt from the, from the Wolf book about the president, uh, quote, when he got on the phone after dinner, he'd speculate on the flaws and weaknesses of each member of his staff. Bannon was disloyal, not to mention he always looks like uh, an expletive. Priebus was weak, not to mention he was short, a midget. Kushner was a suck-up. Sean Spicer was stupid and looked terrible, too. Conway was a crybaby. Jared and Ivanka should never have come to Washington. I mean, it sounds like stuff, I, I guess he might say, we know he likes to, to poll friends about figures in his administration. But again, the White House is calling this book tabloid trash. 
Well, I mean, look, a lot of these charges or, or assertions do have the ring of truth. I mean, Trump is well known for, for polling people about how they think his staff is doing uh, and being very critical of, of, of people who work for him. So, uh, you know, there's nothing to say that that isn't true. Right. Right. No, he polls, he polls members of his staff on one another. That he definitely does. Mm-hmm. And, 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 he, and he vents to each of them. Right. Well, and Anderson, the, the one other thing, too, I, I think it's consistent. Yes. You know, I'm that, sorry, what, Josh? Yeah, sorry. I said, I said, you know, part of this, I, I'm not sure that the White House anger is so much driven by Wolf's characterization of staffers so much as it is the idea that uh, Trump is an idiot or, or, or is stupid and isn't, isn't, uh, doesn't deserve the credit for his own victory. I mean, the thing that Trump objected to so vehemently about my book, I'm told, is that my thesis was that he wouldn't have been elected president without Steve Bannon. The parts of Wolf's book that I've read certainly seem to share that subtext. I think that that is what has so angered Trump and caused him to go after Bannon in, in the personal nature that he did in the statements. Yeah. Uh, Maggie, Michael, Josh, thank you. Up next, Paul Manafort is suing the Justice Department, saying Robert Mueller has overstepped his authority. We'll take a look at whether that lawsuit has any merit. We'll talk about it with Carl Bernstein and Jeffrey Tubin, and we'll get their thoughts, obviously, on this new Wolf uh, book as well. Former Trump campaign chair, uh, Chairman Paul Manafort is suing the Justice Department, saying that special counsel Robert Mueller overstepped his authority in charging him with crimes that aren't related to the campaign. Manafort has been indicted on money laundering and other charges. In a statement, a Justice Department spokesman says the lawsuit is frivolous, but, quote, the defendant is entitled to file whatever he wants. Joining me now is CNN political analyst, author and legendary journalist Carl Bernstein and CNN chief legal analyst Jeffrey Tubin. And not, not so legendary well, journalist. You know, <laughs> that's right. Well, I have it. Right. Right. Absolutely accurate. Is there any merit? To, uh, to Manafort's suit? I, I, I think it's very unlikely to succeed. Um, it's, not a, it's not a crazy idea. You know, in 1987, when I was one of the junior members of the team that, defended, that, that prosecuted Oliver North, North filed a very similar lawsuit trying to get the case, mm. uh, you know, the, the Walsh appointment. Uh, Lawrence Walsh, who was the independent counsel, trying to get him disqualified. Um, I think uh, this is even less likely to succeed, as, as, as North suit did not succeed. It, it might have a somewhat better chance as a motion to dismiss the indictment once he gets to trial, as opposed to an entirely separate lawsuit. But I think, you know, politically, it is just another example of how every tool is being used to try to discredit Mueller. Now it's his unco- now he doesn't have the right to do what he's doing. His staff is biased. Right. I mean, you, you just see day after day this is going on. Does it tell you, Carl, something about where the investigation is? A lot. This is a concert, part of a concerted effort uh, by people around Donald Trump to make this investigation go away. And what we have seen in the past 24 hours with these tweets, that my button is bigger than your button, that I stopped airplane crashes, and now this extraordinary book uh, that, that goes to the same picture that all of us have known about Donald Trump and have talked about for months. This is about a toxic president and a toxic presidency and a dangerous presidency. And meanwhile, in the midst of this, we have a criminal investigation that is now moving closer to Donald Trump's children. And particularly one of the things that has got Donald Trump very rattled is this Trump Tower meeting. And the fact that Donald Trump came up with the cover story that is part of a cover-up of what actually occurred, the story was concocted on the plane that that meeting had nothing to do with with those Russians there. It had to do with orphaned children, et cetera, et cetera. Donald Trump dictated that account. And he knows that Mueller has now pieced together exactly what happened on that airplane. And that's one of the things on just one indicative aspect of what's happening here. But really, it's about the toxicity of a president of the United States, his actions, his fitness, both in terms of possible criminality and his stability. Mm. That's really what this book is about. Jeff, I mean, politically, could it be good for Mueller that, you know, a federal judge will rule on Manafort's suit? Well, I, you know, I, with the, all the these thing, attacks the, going, the thing against about Mueller is, I don't think he cares about his political posture. Mm. He cares about bringing his case. I mean, this is someone unique in Washington recent history who has no 
public relations apparatus at all. He's going to want to win this lawsuit because it means he can proceed. But I don't think he, you know, gets up in the morning and thinks, you know, how is my political positioning different than it was yesterday? He's got cases to investigate. He's got a trial to, 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 to proceed to in May. That's what he's worried about. And I don't, I don't think he's worried about you know, how he's perceived. Carl, I mean, you know better than anybody. You've seen a White House under investigation by yourself and others. How do you see how this White House is responding to all these investigations? Uh, it's, it's responding as if it is part of a train wreck and is a cause of a train wreck. And it doesn't know what to do, partly because the president of the United States uh, is himself calling the shots here, not listening to legal advice. But the facts are the problem here. It is the facts of the way this president conducts himself that are now mixed up with the response to the Mueller inquiry. That the president, in his response to this investigation, has shown his instability. And the two things are now wrapped up together. And that's the train wreck. Mm. And that's the difference between Watergate. The essential difference is the response of Republicans. Republicans were the heroes in Watergate. They said, we, this is not about our party. This is about a criminal president of the but, United but, States. But wait, it took and a while. I mean, it, it, of course it, it, it took, I mean, it, well, it, it started in, in the hearings, in, in the Senate Watergate. And, yeah. It started, they were determined the to get, that's nice. Let, well, uh, well, your phone is on. <laughs> let, let me just make an editorial comment. Right. Right. Um, okay. Let me just switch. The, the, I want to read a quote from uh, from this uh, from the new book uh, by Michael Wolf regarding Mueller's investigation. This is all about money laundering. Mueller chose senior prosecutor Andrew Weissman first, and he is a money laundering guy. Their path to effing Trump goes right through Paul Manafort, Don Jr., and Jared Kushner. It's as plain as a hair on your face. This is uh, allegedly, according to Michael Wolf, a quote. Uh, from Steve Bannon. That is devastating. I think accurate and even more devastating is another passage from the book where uh, Bannon talks about Deutsche Bank. Right. Deutsche Bank, I think, is the thing that Donald Trump and Jared Kushner want least to go into because, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, none of the big New York banks would deal with Donald Trump. So he, he, used, he used Deutsche Bank exclusively. That's where all of his financial transactions go through, as far as we know. And if, in fact, Mueller is going through D Deutsche Bank for both Kushner and Trump, that's got to be very scary because... That's that's where all where where all the where all the money goes. And, you know, uh, if there's anything untoward to find, Mueller's going to find it. Carl, how, what do you think of the excerpts you've seen of the Wolf book? I think that it paints a picture that is very consistent with what all of us have been reporting. Uh, Maggie Haberman said it said it herself. It's it's we've seen it in The New York Times. We've seen it on CNN. We've seen it in The Washington Post. Uh, we've seen it in Michael D'Antonio's uh, book. On and on and on. This is the real Donald Trump and why I talk about this toxicity, because we have never had a president of the United States who reacts to events such as we've seen in the last three days. We have never seen, uh, you know, these tweets are a roadmap of Donald Trump's mind. Uh, it's a rather ugly twisted road. And and, and, and and we keep seeing one indication after another of why it is that in private, as I've been saying here on this air for a long time, that Republicans to each other are saying, we doubt this president's stability, and yet they won't say it in public. Yeah. Well, you know, the tweet yesterday that I found so unbelievably unprecedented and offensive was the one where he basically said, why isn't the Justice Department putting Huma Abedin in jail? I mean, think about that. Think about the president of the United States targeting an individual who is not even under investigation, as far as I know, and saying to the Justice Department that yeah. he controls, that he wants to see this woman in jail. We have never seen that in American history, except perhaps in the Alien and Sedition Acts under John Adams. I mean, that's how far back you have to go back to see, to see a president, you know, uh, abusing his power. Uh, over the criminal justice system. And, you know, I, I, you know, Carl goes a little farther than I do in terms of how, you know, how, how bad Donald Trump is. 
but but I think that indicates a level of panic that is really well. One thing, Donald Trump has had a real sense of where a big part of this country country is. So I, I don't denigrate him in that sense. He's had a better sense of where part of the country is, especially in terms of his base, than his opponents have. But I'm talking about his conduct. Uh, that's really what this Carl is Burson, about. appreciate it. Jeffrey Tubin as well. Coming up, why today's book excerpts have put Steve Bannon on the list of people the Senate Intelligence Committee would like to have a word with. We'll hear from the vice chairman of that committee next. The vice chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee agrees with Steve Bannon on at least one issue that the Trump campaign should have told the FBI about that Trump Tower meeting. As we've reported, Bannon, according to a new book by Michael Wolff, went so far as to call that meeting treasonous. I spoke with Senator Mark Warner just before air. Senator Warner, according to this new book, Steve Bannon said the meeting at Trump Tower between Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, Paul Manafort, and Russians promising during Hillary Clinton was treasonous, unpatriotic, and should have been reported to the FBI immediately. Do you agree with that? Well, I think it's pretty amazing that the president's most senior political advisor through the end of the campaign and then for the first few months of his administration made these kind of allegations. The one thing I absolutely agree with Mr. Bannon, I don't usually sort him as a, as a source, is that any reasonable persons, when Russians come over and offer dirt during the middle of the campaign on your opponent, should have reported that to law enforcement. Clearly, even the Australians understood that because the New York Times recently reported that Mr. Papadopoulos, another Trump campaign affiliate who got offered the same kind of dirt, uh, told the Australians. And when the Australians ambassador saw that the emails started to get released, they were smart enough to go to the FBI. So I do agree with uh, at least Mr. Bannon on the fact that the participants of that meeting uh, should have uh, revealed that to law enforcement in our country. I mean, Bannon is also quoted saying that the chances that Donald Trump Jr. didn't bring the Russians, quote, up to his father's office on the 26th floor is zero. Is there anything you've seen corroborating that contention or the, the notion that Donald Trump Jr. may have talked to his father about the content of that meeting? Listen, Mr. Bannon makes that allegation, whether it's the Mueller effort or whether it's our congressional investigation. I'd like to get to the bottom of that and find out uh, why he made that allegation and if it's true or not. Do you want him to testify, Bannon? I think Mr. Bannon should testify either before us or before Mr. Mueller. Clearly, if he's going to make these kind of allegations, I'd like to know on, under what basis. Bannon also, according to the book, contends that the Mueller investigation will focus on money laundering, saying, quote, their path to effing Trump goes right through Paul Manafort, Don Jr. and Jared Kushner. Went on to reference a report that federal prosecutors had subpoenaed records from Deutsche Bank regarding Kushner's family uh, company, saying, quote, it goes through Deutsche Bank and all the Kushner... Uh, expletive. The Kushner expletive is greasy. They're going to roll those two guys up and say, play me or trade me. Is money laundering something your committee is looking at? Money laundering falls more into the criminal investigation. That's more the purview of Special Prosecutor Mueller. Uh, we're more looking at collaboration and collusion and what could arise out of that. Uh, but let's make clear, Mr. Bannon's comments about at least Deutsche Bank and others, um, isn't the first time. We've heard allegations similar to that coming out of the dossier, and there have been other rumors. But again, I'm not going to comment on those until we finish our investigation. The, the founders of Fusion GPS, as you know, wrote an op-ed, and it read in part, a generation ago, Republicans sought to protect President Richard Nixon by urging the Senate Watergate Committee to look at supposed wrongdoing by Democrats in previous elections. Went on to say that that is happening again today by the president and his allies focusing on the dossier and who paid for it rather than the Russian meddling in our election. I'm wondering if you agree with what they say there. Well, I agree that there does seem to be a lot of smoke screens in terms of certain members, particularly of the House and others, attacking the integrity of Bob Mueller or attacking, for that matter, the FBI and the Justice Department. I don't think that does our country long-term good in terms of the faith in our institutions. Um, but I think that the, the underlying basis of the dossier is what's the substantive issue. Should we, is that dossier true or not? And I know Mr. Mueller's looking at it, and I think uh, we're trying to sort through that as well, because clearly there are very, very serious allegations. And one of the things with the GPS fusion individuals, I'd like to have them back in to testify, but I'd also like to have back in to testify uh, before the committee members, because people like 
Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, um, Michael Cohen, Mr. Trump's lawyer. They have testified before my staff, our staff, but not before the members and for that matter, not before the public. You say you want the GPS founders back to testify publicly. They say that, you know, they've, there's hours of testimony, 21 hours uh, in total, uh, and that they would like the transcripts of that released. Is that something you would support? Listen, I think what we've got to do is get their story out. That will be something we'll work through, whether it's whether it's we don't normally release prior testimony because it's uh, it might impugn further uh, witnesses from coming forward. But uh, if they've got an additional story to tell, I think they ought to have a chance to tell it. Lastly, the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, FBI Director Chris Wray met with Speaker Paul Ryan tonight about the House Intelligence Committee's Russia investigation. Can you tell us anything about that, Senator? Do you, do you know anything about that? I, I you know, it's been... The House Intelligence Committee has taken a very different path than the Senate Committee. In the Senate Committee, I'm proud of the fact we've had some bumps, but we're still at this in a bipartisan way. We're still committed to getting all the facts, doing it as quickly as possible, but doing it in a way that's thorough and complete so that we can then present our case and, more importantly, our findings to the American people so they can draw their own conclusions, but also so we can make sure it never happens again. Senator Warner, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, Ardana Bash has new reporting on what's fueling the president's last two days of fury ever since he returned to Washington. More breaking news tonight. We have new details on what has fueled President Trump's last two days of uh, erratic behavior or tweets, all those explosive tweets on everything from North Korea and a nuclear button, the Russian investigation, as well as his heated reaction to the Steve Bannon allegations in this new book that we've been talking about tonight. Seen as Dana Bash has new details and she joins us now. So what have you been uh, hearing from your reporting? What does it tell you about the president's mindset as he launched uh, these tweets? Well, Anderson, the tweets were so over the top and so disruptive on several sensitive national security fronts that I and my colleagues here in Washington, including and especially White House producer Kevin Littak, set out to find out whether or not there was something that specifically set the president off. And what sources familiar with the president's thinking told us is that it was largely driven by uh, the idea, his behavior was driven by the idea that he is just furious about the Russia investigation, specifically the fact that the legal team around him has been telling him that the special counsel investigation was going to be over. Well, here he is starting 2018 back at the White House and the Russia cloud is still very much hanging over him. And that, of course, was exacerbated by the fact that he was coming back off of a trip to Florida over the holidays, where by all accounts, he was really relaxed, golfing, and really in his happy place with his family, Anderson. Do we know if the president's frustration was also connected to what Bannon said in his book? Was that advanced knowledge of it? Well, the White House was obviously well aware that this book was coming. My understanding, though, Anderson, is that they didn't know about the salacious uh, details in it or the things that Bannon is quoted as saying on the record, especially about the Russia investigation. That, of course, hit a very raw nerve for the president. As I mentioned, he was already and still is already very upset about it. Obviously, publicly, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, you know, backs up the president's tweets in, in, mm-hmm. in briefings. Is I mean, is his team trying to manage at all his tweets? Some are, uh, or at least try to get the message to the president that some of the things that he's tweeted over the past 24 to 48 hours uh, are not good for American policy, uh, national security in particular, things about North Korea and the leader there that he said uh, that and there has been a, a bit of an attempt to talk to people who may have some influence with the president, on the president, especially in national security, to convince him that this kind of thing should not be done, that they cross the line and kind of make him look unstable uh, across the world. Now, unclear if those messages were actually delivered to the president today, but I should also note that there is no sense of anybody that we talk to that the president is going to convince, to be convinced not to tweet anymore, Anderson. Yeah. All right. Dana Bash, Dana, thanks very much. Coming up, we're going to have more stunning details from the new book on the Trump White House, the explosive reaction from the president, how he's firing back at Steve Bannon next. 